John, you had talked to us about the market, what you're seeing coming up in the market. You talked to us, us about how you've structured some of your initial deals. And you said you've used syndication as a tool for uh, building your 565 unit portfolio, your multi multifamily portfolio. And I think syndication has been a thing we've heard more and more about in our world. People asking that question, how does it work? What are the ingredients of a good syndication? Um, if someone's just checking this out or even maybe has people saying, hey, I'd love, I've got some money. Are you putting fun together? Are you putting a syndication together? And then someone's in the space where they have the ability to do it. What advice or, or like I say, what are the simple ingredients to get something like that executed? Yeah, it's a great question and something I often get from my audience as well. So I'm happy to, to tap into this because I think it is a hot topic with, with where we're at with things. So, you know, analogy that I often use when we're talking about syndications is it's, it's no different than like building a house, right? You have a general contractor, if you will, that's, that's quarterbacking or, you know, working with all the special tradesmen on building the house. The, the general contractor isn't the one that's actually, you know, putting the drywall up and laying down the finishings and, and painting the walls and all of that. They're, they're just coordinating everything is essentially what they're doing, right? Now, sometimes contractors will act as subs and they'll play some part of a specialty at, in, you know, at, at times. But for the most part, what they're doing is they're just making sure they, they understand the vision. They understand where the homeowner, how they envision the house and how they want it to look. And their job is to make sure everything goes as planned. And so that's in essence what a syndicator does in simplistic terms, right? They are the contractor as it pertains to the asset um, that in discussion, which is in this case is the real estate, right? And so they're bringing in subs like property management, capital raising teams, uh, due diligence, boots on the ground. Um, so they're, they're in essence, you know, quarterbacking or uh, coordinating all these different um, subs, if you will, into bringing a deal to fruition, and so um, so that the, so the deal could happen, and so that's what we do in in the syndication world. Is you know I act as a general partner, which basically means that I'm 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 the head honcho. I'm in charge of making sure that things go as planned, and so I like to break syndication up into three to four primary roles. So one of those happens to be uh, locating the deal. So who is the person that found the deals? That's one critical piece of the puzzle. You got to have a deal in order to, to take it down, right? So um, that's one piece. Uh, another piece is kind of due diligence, post acquisition work as it pertains to boots on the ground. Who's going to physically walk this property? Who's going to be doing that on a frequent basis? Who's going to make sure that we have to do any capital improvements, things of that nature? Who's going to be the person making sure that stuff gets done, right? And then we have, um, I'd often refer as the third aspect would be um, the capital raising, huge component of all this, especially if you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. The last two properties that I closed was worth uh, combined was about thirteen million dollars of real estate. It takes money to be able to close that close that level of, of, of volume, right? And so it requires capital raising. And uh, so some people that's they're called a capital raiser. Their their whole job is to help you know bring in capital to the project and um, so that we can acquire it and and you know perform all the improvements that we want to, to increase values, et cetera. And then probably the most critical component, which oftentimes is, is owned by the syndicator themselves, is the asset management. So once, once the asset has been acquired, who's going to make sure that we're having the property management calls weekly? We're, we're making sure that we're driving towards the KPIs, the goals, the performance metrics that we put out. Those are kind of the four main roles of a syndication. So we have you know, the deal hunter, the person that located the deal, we have boots on the ground, we have capital raising, we have asset management, you got four major parts of a deal, right? And so how you slice and dice that 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 cake up or that pie up really is, it varies. It depends on the relationships. It depends on the ROIs that are in, that are in question. It depends on the deal structure. There's just a lot of nuances that go into it. So I won't go into too many details there because I could talk about that stuff for days and bore your audience. But one thing I do want to touch on here that I think is really important for your audience to understand is I find, and I referred to this earlier in the podcast, too many people go into this with a blanketed approach without understanding the why behind it is, behind why it is that they're doing or suggesting a certain structure. 
I see this all the time. And it's questions you'll see in uh, communities. What should be my split? What should the split arrangement be? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, it depends on your return on your investment. It depends on the roles. It depends on the responsibilities. And so where I've been able to, I think, also retain more equity is because I actually understand the why behind it. Right? I'm not just saying, okay, well, this guru told me that I should do a 70-30 or 80-20 or 60-40 right? I didn't do that. I, I tried to understand why it is that we would do it that way. And what I uncovered is most of the times, uh, people didn't have a good answer to that question. They didn't know themselves. I've talked to gurus, if you will, that I'm like, hey, why did you, why did you structure that deal that way? Well, that's just the way that we do it. But why? Why did you choose that structure? And so for me, I take a more of an analytical approach to my deals. And so what I'm really trying to accomplish is you know, my investor base, mostly in technology, business owners, you know, these are savvy individuals that are extremely busy. They do not want to play an active role at all in their in this project. They just want to be a passive investor. They have a certain level of expectation for the type of return that they expect on the dollar amounts that they're injecting in my deals. Typically, you know, minimums usually a hundred grand that people throw in a half a million dollars into my deals. And so you know, for them, um, it's all about risk and reward and, and what their involvement is. And so typically I'm getting my investors, you know, anywhere from a 10 to 15% cash on cash, total return, you know, 20 to 30%. If I can do that, where they just get mailbox money, they're tickled. And so that means uh, me giving up 10% of equity for that raise or 20, or in some cases five, it's really less dependent upon the equity percentage. I mean, equity does matter, but it's more specifically, what is the ROI? What is the return on their investment for uh, you know, investing in that project? And I think something that um, often isn't talked about enough because people don't want to have these tough conversations is anyone could put numbers on a pitch deck, right? Anyone can say, hey, I'm going to go get you 30%, but can you deliver that? Can you deliver the returns that you're projecting? And so, you know, I look at these pitch decks all the time and people are very unrealistic with their pro formas, you know, calling double digit year over year growth, low vacancy, expense ratios are, are, are really low, un, under called. So, yeah, you're offering some crazy numbers because your pitch, your, 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 your projections are, are too light, right? So uh, for me, it's all about, um, an investor told me this once, it'll rest, it's the biggest check I've ever gotten from an investor, didn't even look at the pitch deck. He said, John, I'm betting on the jockey. I don't need to see the pitch deck. And so you have to understand that this is a relationship business, especially when you're raising capital. A lot of times it's more about do they trust you and your capabilities to deliver? Are you going to back up your words? That makes the difference ultimately versus some guy that's really good in PowerPoint or Excel or whatever and makes making a fancy projection um, you know, trying to sell people on that. That uh, is so unbelievably full of excitement, confidence, and pressure, man. When he says, I'm betting on the jockey, and you're like, oh, wait, uh, I better make sure I'm doing what I say here. You know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a huge piece of this for people that are, hey, I've done this before. I hit this returns for my own place. And I can show some of this, but it still doesn't give you ultimate confidence to go in and replicate it because every deal is unique, right? How do you, did you take that as like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm, I got to make sure to put my money where my mouth is here. How did, how did you take that? Or were you just very, very confident in some of these deals that you, you can't predict the future though, right, John? Yeah. I mean, here's the deal. You know, I think, you know, savvy investors understand that things aren't always going to go be rainbows and, and butterflies, right? Like it's not always going to be happy days. And so for me, it's also being able to have those tough conversations around, you know, sometimes our timelines are a little stretch or, you know, things don't always go as planned. We're going to get it there. Maybe there's just things that happen. And so what they're really saying is, is, hey, I understand that things aren't going to always go as planned, but I think you've been very conservative in your uh, your outlook here. So like, yeah, you may get some puts and some takes, right? But overall, I just want to make sure that we're winning. And more importantly, you know, a, a, a guy that's worth about a hundred, worth a hundred billion, not not have a hundred billion on his assets but, and on his balance sheet, but he's worth a hundred billion. Told me this. He said, you know, most rich people are focused on um, return uh, or are focused on um, return of or return on capital 
wealthy people are focused more on return of capital, meaning security, like, hey, things may happen, but I'm not losing my money, right? Like, so maybe my, maybe I don't quite hit the, 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 the pro forma, but um, I've yet not to deliver. But the point being is, is that I'm, I'm doing all I can and they know, my investors know that I'm gonna do everything in my power to protect their money, protect the asset and do what's right by not only my investor, but myself um, and, and, and my partners. And sometimes that means being able to address, you know, not not so great conversations of like, hey, we had this happen. I mean, I, I could go on for days of things that didn't go as planned, right? But we worked through it. We we had a solution. It's all about solving for problems, right? So for me, I'm very confident in my problem solving abilities. So even if I do have problems, which I know I'm going to have, my ability to get through those and solve for them, I am very confident in that. And so sometimes that means our timeline shift a little bit. But I'm but I'm very confident in my abilities to deliver for my investors. Man, John, we're heating up here, man. Return of capital versus return on capital. Man, that is yep. that is awesome. And return of capital, of course, being once you have all your money back in a deal, you don't have any risk left. I mean, that's the complete de-risking tactic is to get your money back. Um, man, I, I want to go back to your why point because that was that really hit me. Uh, hey, how do these deals get structured? I find myself asking that. Uh, oh, how did you structure that syndication? Or how did you structure this, this fund that you started? And it's a uh, 70-30 or 80-20. Uh, and when you ask the question why, to your point, it's, it's just because that's what I've seen. You know, that is not a good answer. You, it was very convicting because honestly... Uh, I, I've done this before. We've raised money. We've, we've, we've had a fund and it's like, well, it's just what we've seen other people do, but why? And, and what you touched on, and if you're willing to share, John, you know, how, what is your, the reason why for you and how have you structured the equity on these? Because you've shared this with me a little bit, and I think it's very much a tie to the question, to the reason why, um, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'd love for you to share on like how you've kind of structured yours and why. Yeah. So again, every deal is a little bit different. I mean, I don't know if I've taken a deal down or replicated the exact way I've done every deal, to be honest, like it's, they're all different. Um, but what I look at is I'm really looking at the value that I'm creating and, and typically for investors, if you're involving investors, it's an ROI, right? It's, it's what they're going to get in terms of return. And so what is your investor base's expectations, right? So we're living in a world where, you know, six months ago, even six months ago, Everyone was winning everywhere. Stock market was through the roof. Real estate was happening. Everything was hunky dory. It was great. And you're seeing these, you were seeing these high prep um, commitments of 12, 15. I'm like, you guys are crazy. Like <laughs> that, that's the times are good right now, but what what if things don't, what if things aren't that great? And here we are where where, where things aren't that great, right? And so what I've done is I've I've avoided falling into the trap of over committing and under delivering. And so it's uh, going back to the sa the sales approach, understanding what is it that the investor is seeking out? Are they seeking steady cash flow? Are they in a point in their life where they want more volatility? Do they want to take on, do they want to assume more risk? Do they want more guarantee? And so I have some investors that have given me money without any equity at all. They're just like, hey, I just want a fixed amount. I'm like, great. Well, in order for me to guarantee you something, that means I, I, I'm going to take on more risk. And so for, with that, I got to take these things off the, off the table, off the plate, right? Which means maybe it's equity, maybe it's other pieces. But for me, it's, it's meeting, with, meeting them where they're at, but also helping them understand you know, the, the, the why behind what I'm suggesting to them. If it's you know, uh, you know, payout amounts or percentages or what have you, I'm helping them understand what they should expect from me. And sometimes that's even been the case of, I've had people say, well, look, I, I could go over here and get a better split, more equity. I said, then why don't you do that? Right. And so sometimes you got to be willing to let them go because maybe it just doesn't fit or align with you and your investment uh, strategy. Not everyone's going to be a marriage. Right. And so I treat, you know, I, I want to work with many people that I can, but trust me when I say you don't want everyone to be your investor. Right. For me, I don't even entertain less than 50 grand because you're not ready to step into this deal. My investors, I never hear from them. We 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 mm -hmm. have to send them communication. It's not their last dollar, right? So, like it, it, these things are like, and I like it that way, not because I'm I don't want to communicate with them because I love them, a lot of them are friends and close acquaintances, whatever. 
But um, it's the way that I like to operate. I like to be able to say, hey, you trust me. I trust you. Give me some autonomy. Whereas if you got someone that put their last dollar into a deal, they're calling you up every day. Like, hey, what, what's going on with this? Like, where are we at? You know, and it applies additional pressure, unneeded pressure and things of that nature. So I think what I'm trying to relay here, and sorry, I've been a long day, but is you don't, you're not looking to make everyone an investor, nor are you trying to make everyone a partner. You need to figure out what is your what is your strategy? What what is your approach? What is the package that you're offering? And find people that want to play within that sandbox. It's really mm. that simple. I just think people get desperate, and so they take things that they don't normally want to. They they don't they take things they normally wouldn't just so they can get something done. Um, and that stuff's going to come back to bite them, unfortunately. Whereas I've stayed tr- uh, stride, tried and true, if you will, to saying, hey. I'm flexible. I'm adapt up to a certain point. And then if I feel like, you know, there's not a fair, equitable um, give and take happening between investors or a, a, a partner or a seller, then I'm backing away from it because it's it's not worth, you know, um, for me, it's not worth going into that marriage ultimately, because that's what we're doing. It's not worth going into that knowing that, hey, it's going to blow up probably in a short period of time because I just I just tried to force something. Yeah. And, you know, John, I'm hearing your your themes of getting to know your seller come back to getting to know your investor the same way and understanding what their goals are, what their why is, because I'm, I'm hearing stuff like if they need higher guarantees, which is less risk for them, it's going to equal lower equity because you need to pull some of those those spiffs, if you will, away from that, you know, the benefit package if they're going to have a higher guarantee. Um you know, if they want higher equity or they want more of that long-term thinking, you know, it might be more of a preferred return rather than the guaranteed. Is this, st- are these the knobs you're talking about turning with, with different investors as you get to know their, their reason why? Yeah. So not to get in, I'm not your legal attorney. I'm not your CPA. I want to throw those disclaimers out there, but um, you know, understanding your investor base before you start to approach them is really important. So for me, like I don't, you know, I won't even consider taking someone's money unless I've had a you know, an introductory call, gotten to know them, you know, built a relationship, et cetera. I'm not just throwing my pitch decks out to everyone. I also segment my investor base based on their needs, their desires, their wants. And so I have folks that are just, no, I'm, I'm a, I'm going to be a, like a promissory lender. Like I want to give you money, be tied to the asset, no equity, just want a fixed, you know, percentage back on my money. Those are typically short-term players. They're looking to deploy capital for a couple of years to three years. And sometimes those uh, those relationships make sense for the projects that we're on, and or or just you know what we're doing. Um, but then I have people typically when I'm doing from um, a syndication standpoint, if it's truly a syndicator where I'm bringing in investors, getting some equity, whatever, um, you know, my people I just tell them like, hey, my goal is to to under promise over deliver. Um, so a lot of the timelines that I projected have been five, seven years in some cases. Like, hey, I, we could do this in two, but we don't know what the interest rates are going to be. You know what I mean? So like. I don't want to paint that that picture that we're going to come in here and 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 do this in two years when we in fact we're going to be five to do it. Um, and so I'm trying to bucket these investors based on their risk profile, based on their preferences, based on their expectations. And so I can almost marry them to the deal I think best fits them. You know what I mean? As an investor, because not every investor is going to be right for every deal. You you got to understand. Going back to understanding, you got to understand the deal, and you got to also understand um, the capital the investors that you're working with so you can marry them together at some point down the road. Yeah. And, you know, you touched on the, the four, the four pieces of the puzzle, Um, you know, the deal finder, due diligence, capital, raising capital, and then the asset management early in doing this, John, did you have to wear a lot of those hats or was that something that you have, you just knew, like, I am not going to be doing asset management. I need to find the right partner or, I can, or I'm not doing it at all. Or is this something that you kind of dabbled in and then and then leveraged and, and built a team after? Yeah. So uh, typical, you know, roll your sleeves up kind of kind of situation here. Uh, <laughs> I, I was wearing all the hats and I still do in a lot of cases, right? Um, you know, but what, what I have done that I think is very strategic, I, I have a, a general partner. We don't actually have a formal partnership, if you will, but we do a tons of deals together. What I've gotten better at in general and in, in life is understanding more about understanding more of the things that I do not want to do, right? Mm-hmm. So through those trial and tribulations, through those life lessons, I've uncovered things that I just 
not passionate about, I'm not good at, or, you know, whatever. And um, I'm trying to avoid doing the things that, you know, just really don't bring me energy and fulfillment. And so one of those happens to be the, the boots on the ground. I'm a transient person. I'm in tech. I, I mean, my laptop and essentially I can do my job anywhere. And so I've extended that environment into the work that I do here in real estate. And so I have a partner that I strategically partnered with. He resides in Indiana, uh, Mike Hoshleather, just a little shout out to him. Um, great guy, very seasoned business owner. He, he runs an eight figure uh, co- uh, utility contracting company aside to his real estate por- portfolio with me. But uh, we we have a great team together. Um, he is is local to the area. He he acts more as boots on the ground. He also has a construction background, so all that boots on the ground stuff. It just it's his world, and you know he understands it better than I do. So I've gotten very strategic about my relationships and being able to leverage people in their skill sets. Right. So I'm good at numbers. Like I'm the I'm the nerd behind the scenes in the Excel sheets. You know, like I nerd out about that stuff. Um, I'm also really good about organizational management, um, SOPs, and and scaling things. Like that's what I'm good at. And so I try to just focus in on that. Like, hey, let me do what I'm good at, and then I'll let these other people do what they're good at. Um, and so I really play more of the asset management, specifically on their operational side. Um, I've done a, I've raised about six million dollars in private equity over the last eighteen months um, from my network. And I don't even consider myself great at capital raising, to be honest with you, but I've been able to do yeah. it. Um, and so, you know, and, and I and I do boots on the ground. I'll travel, I'll fly in and I'll look at properties. I do think it's helpful to get your eyes on a property, right? But what I'm getting at is I just do whatever it's, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. But as we start to scale, we're starting to, um, we're starting to uh, specialize, if you will, on these roles and responsibilities. So I'm building, I'm, I'm building, I'm investing in the future $100 million portfolio today. So when I get there, I can actually manage it, right? So there's mm-hmm. investments happening as we speak into this business. I'm investing into the business to prepare us to be ready for the $100 million portfolio before we actually get there. Yes. Yeah. And I think people that are thinking about getting this going and are being, you know, finding themselves in overwhelm or analysis paralysis is understanding the seats on the bus and then understanding which ones you're really drawn to or which ones you're really, really good at and being honest with yourself on, what, like John said, what you're not interested in or what you're not good at. I think some of the rub that people feel is when you're sitting in one of those seats that you're not necessarily good at. And then that's kind of a recipe for forced, you know, forcing a capital raise or forcing the numbers to work if that's not your jam, you know? So, so, so I think constructing your team around this stuff, if you're, if you're thinking about getting into this can be a crucial part. And yes, you're going to have those roll up your roll up the sleeves moments, but man, if you can, if you can have find the yin to your yang on some of these things, if you can find your weakness and, and find somebody where that's their strength, that can be such a crucial component of success. Like you said, your due diligence partner, man, that has probably been a, a, a huge strategic partnership for the reason why you guys have been, been able to make these perform in my mind. So, well, I think it goes back to lifestyle too. Like, what kind of lifestyle you want to live, right? Like, yeah, yeah I could jump on a plane and fly back to Indiana every week, but do I want to do that? No, yeah. no, I really don't. Right. So like, you know, money's great. You know, I want to make a ton of it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we've made a lot of money this year, but, um, you know, fulfillment, energy, um, uh, family, you know, time, I don't want to trade one active gig for the net for another. Right. I, I'm trying yeah. to create a life, a lifestyle of design and for me, it's like, okay, we're dealing with a huge watermelon here. So we can slice and dice it. There's, there's plenty to go around here, right? So yes. I think it's just more of an abundance mindset that you have to have. You really have to have it in order to scale the, at the propensity that we're talking about here. You're purchasing hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate. You have to have a team. You can't do that by yourself. So it's understanding that. Now, you may say, hey, no, I don't want a big team. And I don't, I don't, I don't want a $200 million portfolio. Oh, cool. You can own. I I know some guys that own a hundred doors that own it clean and you know clean clear. They don't own the bank any money. They don't have any partners, and they do well. My neighbor owns um, a a mobile home park uh, portfolio out of Charleston, and he he's like 30, 30, 40 grand a month, I believe. He nets. Um, You would never know it, (laughs) you know. So uh, (laughs) it's just what what are you looking for? You know what I mean? The kind of thing is what what you got to figure out. Man. 
John, I've really enjoyed this conversation, man. I think you've you've shed light on so many aspects of how uh, of starting this, where you where you came from, growing to a larger. Point.